Hello there. Here's a very special treat for you. Back in October, we helped Liam Brady launch his new book with an exclusive roadshow where he was joined by the legendary duo of Eamon Dunphy and John Giles. If you want more of this great content, then sign up on offtheball.com forward slash join for unlimited podcast access. Or if you want to watch, you can sign up on youtube.com forward slash offtheball. Enjoy. Liam is still with us. Can we give a very warm welcome, please, to Mr. John Giles, everybody. And last, but most certainly not least, they've all made a great effort to be here. Eamon Dunphy, everybody. It's uh, genuinely very special to have you all here. This is great, lovely uh, evening. My 14-year-old self wouldn't quite believe it, so that's the kind of night that it is. We were talking about Liam the player. Now, he's too modest to talk about Liam the player properly. That's where you two come in very handy. So, Eamon. How good was Liam Brady? Um, he, was, he was a great player, and when he said about himself and Platini, and he said Platini was a better player, John and I looked at each other, and John, of course, is the oracle on football when it comes to the science and the, the, the details. John, who was the better player? Who was the better player? I think I said Platini. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, okay, but, baby. But, but, but Eamon, Eamon, Game I'm, on. Eamon, I'm picking John it walked him into I, that I, one. I'm, I'm, I'm picking it up now. <laughs> Liam was the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. And that, that's genuine. I was only kidding the last time I said it. Liam was the man. Yeah. Liam was the man. But he's very... The book, by the way, is fantastic. It's a really great read. But um, he's kind of, he's modest, Liam. He's, he's got a great mind, and he was a great player. And the story he tells is great, and everything he's done. There's just one thing I'd like to say, though. Yes. I'm the only person who's ever invited to a book launch who gets slaughtered in the book. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I've got bad news for you, baby. <laughs> I'm writing another one. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you... you uh, no, you no, I, was, <laughs> I just want to get the ground rules right here. <laughs> John, you wrote the foreword, foreword in the book, and uh, you describe Liam, amongst other things, as a beautiful player. Yes. Well, I, I said that because there are a lot of great players... Uh, who, in my opinion, would, I wouldn't describe as beautiful players. They're very effective at what they do, uh, and very, very, obviously very, very good at what they do. But what I always found from Liam the first time I saw him, uh, there was a beauty to his play, in terms of uh, control, using the ball, but getting on the ball, easy on the eye, as we say now. Uh, and also could produce from that particular situation very, very effective play. Because I've seen lads in the past who, who I could describe as beautiful players, but they wouldn't really be effective. Uh, so Liam had the special situation where, in my opinion, it was beautiful to watch and effective. Mm. That perfect combination. Well, that is a perfect combination because you see a lot of great players. We all, we all have. Eamon has, Liam has. Over, over time, I say he's a great player, uh, but he, he doesn't catch the eye. You know, it, it can happen. Uh, I, I mean, I would put Roy Keane in that. In, in that, in my opinion, Roy Keane was a great player, but he, he wasn't attractive on the eye. He couldn't beat players. He couldn't go at Liam could with his left foot and cross the ball in a certain way. Because there's, there's, there's many elements in, in great players, and a lot of it can be different. I think Liam, Liam had the plus. He was effective and easy on the eye. Yes. Well, he was certainly easy on my eye. <laughs> can I show you a photo? This is from Daily Mount. This is a three o'clock kickoff, very famous game because of the energy crisis at the time. So the floodlights aren't going on. And this is 18-year-old Brady's debut, and player manager Johnny Giles has said, Brady, kid, 
you're going straight in, you're starting. Why did you throw him in? How did you know he was ready to go straight in, John? Well, I don't remember doing that <laughs> <laughs> for a start. Uh, I don't know if I was ever in touch with Liam, was I, Liam, about going and getting in? No, the we'd, had a, we'd had a few training sessions. John brought a professional to the Irish team that didn't exist before John came, and he, he, he managed to get the group together in Bisham Abbey, which is a sports centre in, in uh, Buckinghamshire, just outside London. So he got all the team together, you know, he went through how he wanted to play, his philosophy and so forth. Just, just to bond the players. And then we had a game up at Old Trafford against Man United. I don't know whether it was a testimonial or something. It might have been no. almost, it wasn't. Did you arrange the game, John? No, no, I didn't. I think uh, Tommy Doherty was the manager then. And uh, I, think, I think it was a money maker actually for- For United. For United. Yeah. Uh, and it was good, good practice for us. In, yeah, in, in, about, in a, about a month before yeah. uh, the Russia game or the Soviet yeah. Union, uh, as yeah. they were called then. Uh, and I was in the squad up in Manchester, and John put me on the second half, and we played well together, me, John, and Mick Martin in midfield. Mick scored two. We beat United 2-0 at Old Trafford, mm. and uh, we kept the ball, didn't we, John? Yeah. And Tommy Doherty wasn't happy, was he? I, I had a few uh, deals with Tommy Doherty, <laughs> and I never found him happy about anything. <laughs> 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 because most of the time, look, you know, but I was at West Brom at the time, we beat them a couple of times. So managers are not usually happy in that situation. But I think what he was, what, what we happened that night, we got ahead, Liam, if you remember, and we kept possession of the ball a lot. And he was going mad about that because it wasn't good for the spectators. Well, <laughs> I didn't care about the spectators. It was, it was, it was what we were doing was, was the main thing. But I uh, played okay with John. Yeah. And, uh, I was hoping then I might be in for the game against the Soviet Union. Nervous before the game? Uh, against the Soviet Union? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> you're 18, you're playing the first time in, in, uh, in, front of your, in front of your home fans, something I was dreaming about. I'd seen my brother play with John, actually, in 63 against Austria and win. And it was a similar kind of day, in as much as that it was a full house. And, um, well, yeah, we got off to a wonderful start, scored a great goal, you know. Uh, John wanted to play football, uh, and, but he was very professional. Mm. I remember, you know, before the match, very calmly telling everybody what he expected of them. Then at halftime, he said, when the whistle blows for, for at the end of the first half, get into the dressing room as quickly as possible. I want to talk to you. Went in, we were winning 2-0 then. He said, okay, everybody sit down. You need to do this, you need to do that. We'd lost, we'd lost the centre back. Terry Mancini got sent off in about 35 minutes. And John just put everybody right. And amazing to do that while he was, you know, play, a player himself. And he was, he was running the show. And something we'd practiced in the, in the training before was set pieces for and against. And he had this. Uh, uh, scheme, if that's what you call it, with Don Givens. Don, a bit like I described earlier on with Frank Stable, and Don would pretend not to be interested, but John knew that as soon as he, he put his hand on the ball, as soon as he took it off, it was going near post, and Don was arrived, and boom, 3 0, and game over. And Don, Don scored three. He scored three, yeah. 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 You say in the book that from tip off, John passed the ball to you straight away get you settled and your memory of the game is John always been near you yeah well John was telling me where to be you know <laughs> be around here stay here stay here well we just hit it off straight away yeah. playing one twos with one another around you know uh, I don't think uh, it, I, I could have gone any better as a debut you know yeah. win three nil against yeah. like they were expected to uh, to beat us that day you know. but John brought this professionalism to it and 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 a, a flair way of playing, you know, but also uh, in a disciplined fashion. Yeah. Do you remember watching on that day, Eamon? I do, yeah. It was amazing. And the Soviet Union were huge. I mean, they really were. A lot of players, ironically, from Ukraine. Uh, and in fact, at one of the World Cups, the whole Soviet Union team was uh, Dynamo Kiev, uh, all 11. 
and they had some amazing players. And it was a stunning performance. And as Liam has said so articulately, uh, John had this gift um, with players like Liam was a great player, uh, but some of the other lads were top players, but not like Don Gibbons is a very, very good player. But getting uh, out of the whole island we're in mentally, the, psycho the psychology of it, because the FAI were so bad. We were always staying in the Central Hotel where all the sing songs that you mentioned <laughs> earlier, Liam, <laughs> took place. Um, but it was a terrible mess. The tr you'd no proper training gear, the kit was awful. And these fellas who were running at the Blazers, you know, they didn't represent anyone. So to change that culture the way John did took a lot of courage and uh, resourcefulness. And, of course, John had been a player, and I played in teams with John when this was shambles. And we went through, it's hard to imagine now in what, what we've seen in recent years, but we had great players, Frank Stapleton, Liam, you know, Don Givens, and then John started the revolution. It ended up with Jack and his team, but Mark Lawrenson's, John capped Mark Lawrenson first. Mark Lawrenson was playing for Preston. He went on to form a great partnership with Alan Hansen at Liverpool, one of the greatest defensive partnerships of all time. And, and he scored the goal in Scotland, uh, you know, uh, when we actually got to the first European Championship. So what John uh, was the catalyst for in his period was professionalism, uh, respect for his players, and no messing from these boys with the blazers on, you know? Uh, and, and, and no carousing either. And there'd been a lot of carousing. I was in the team at What's carousing time. mean, Eamon? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> your Italian might be good. I think you've done... You've done a bit of it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's going out for Jar. Uh, at the wrong time. At the wrong time. Yeah. And uh, not really committing yourself to the work, which is you have to be fit, you have to be right, uh, and not regarding turning up for Ireland as an excuse for a party. Yes. And that's I what think, I think John what, changed. I, I think what happened at that time, I mean, before I took over as manager, or, or was asked to be a manager of the Irish team, and this, is, this was a big time in, in Irish Ireland. Naaman was very, very prominent in this situation. We had a committee of five that picked a team, right? And the, 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 the main contribution to be a selector of the Irish international team was to know fuck all about football. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that is true. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> this had gone on for years, and Jackie Carey was my first manager. Jackie Carey was one of the great Irish players, but he didn't pick the team. He wasn't that particularly interested in it. So, uh, what it started was I was after I played in the Leeds team that had won the league, and we were playing at the end of the season with the Irish team, and I was left out of the team. I was left at 16, because I wasn't putting it in for Ireland the way I was putting it in for Leeds. Fuck all about the selection committee, yeah. picking all the wrong players yeah. and doing all the, all the things that no, no get together and do for, for that. So uh, I, I pulled out of that thing. And then the next time we played, Eamon was in the, in the yeah. thing, this is long before Liam's time. Uh, we played an international match and we got together and we decided we're going to challenge the selection committee or the FEI to get rid of them. And one of the things that we did, which was really good, you, the selection committee's gone, but you can have your free trips yeah. abroad. Okay. That suited them down to the ground. Okay. Eamon was very prominent in that. But that was the, the, the starting point of Ireland actually being a professional team. You can imagine somebody, uh, in, and I'm not saying Dundalk anywhere else, puts a few bob in, becomes onto the committee, next thing he's selecting the Irish international team. This was a joke, and they left me out because he said they weren't put, I wasn't putting it in for Ireland, what, the way I do for Leeds. And this is one of the most professional teams you ever met in your life. And we're, and that, that was, but we got together in one of the matches uh, before Liam's time, and, and we confronted them. Eamon confronted them, I confronted them a certain way, and we got rid of them. Right. That was, the, that was a huge in, 
position to get rid of that team to get a real, really yeah. professional team, mm. which was the manager would be in charge of the situation and he would pick the team. Yeah, I mean, there was a situation where um, John was dropped. Now, John was one of the greatest players, as was, indeed was Liam. John was like, and he was doing his stuff for Leeds and, and they dropped him. We were playing Denmark. And they picked me and they dropped John. <laughs> but, no, you think about that. But anyway, <laughs> no, it's worse. It's worse. They play, picked a lad from Shelburne who played in John's position in midfield along with me. And Tom Revy said to John, Jesus, he said, I'm going over to Dublin to see this fella who's better than you. <laughs> Needless to say, Denmark hockey did. But that sort of thing was going on. It just a, a final point, <laughs> then I showed up. Um, I got 23 caps, and there was one guy on the selection committee who liked the cut of my jib. Let's put it that no further than that. And I was playing for York when I got my first cap, and it was a huge match for Ireland in Paris, a World Cup playoff against Spain. And we only lost 1-0. How it happened. But I was playing. And um, the first York City player, and the last York City player <laughs> ever to be. But the, the situation when they dropped John, I had a brief moment. I thought, I'm going to refuse to play. And then I thought, no, 50 quid. I play. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got. You got a fiver in cash and a 40. <laughs> Five pound, Jake, and I really thought I bottled it, but that's a true story, isn't it, John? Yeah. About I can't remember the lad's name who played for Shelburne. Freddie Strahan. No, it wasn't. No, no, no Freddie. No. Was what Freddie. name? Sorry, Freddie Strahan. I thought. No, Freddie played. Player, he was ten and a half. No, he's a midfield player. Uh, he was a nice fella. No, we uh, might drop on John Giles. <laughs> It was. It was. Uh, so you were. You got. No, it was a lad. It was a lad. It was a lad that played for Shelburne. I can't think of his name at the yeah. moment. Uh, and, and I met him one time, actually, in a pub. We were having a few drinks down in the toilet. And he, he said, I took over from you in that. <laughs> 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 I took over from you in that was particular match. But, but I'm only saying that to show you what it was like and we, what we would call yes. the good old days yes. or the bad old days. That was the bad old days. But once we got, got rid of the section, then we were OK. Mm. You know, at least we were on the, on the track. I was there for a while, and then Big Jack came in. To be honest, when Big Jack came in, he didn't realise what had happened yeah. in the past yes. and couldn't give a shit yeah. anyway. And he got on, obviously got on to do a, to, to a great job. But that's what it was, the lead up to, to our, our situation at that particular time. It was, it was a biggie to get rid of the selection committee. They'd been there for years. Somebody puts a few bob into Waterford or uh, Rovers or anybody else. The next, next year they're picking the team. It was just totally wrong, but we got rid of them, and then mm. we did progress afterwards uh, from my time and then Jack's time, and obviously later on then Liam came into the equation, uh, Dave O'Leary, Frank Stapleton, uh, Mark, had, Lord, Mark you know, Lawrence. We had, we had, we had, we had, team. We had a top really, team, really yeah. top, top, if top team. Mick Megan got the job, the first person, professional player. Mick was a, the right, late Mick who died a couple of years ago. Yeah. Played for Everton. He's a very good player, Mick, and we played with him, John, and me, and the Irish team. And he was the first professional who got to pick the team. Yes. After the revolution. Yeah. And the first thing he did was drop me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good judge. And I um, lean those, uh, those years when John moved on and Owen Hand came in, and there were a lot of close calls, a lot of bad refereeing decisions, which you mentioned in the book as well. And I know people may find this hard to believe, but you were getting stick in the papers by a certain columnist back home as well, which is hard to believe. You mentioned yeah. it in the book, I think, once or twice or three times. Yeah, well, Eamon, Eamon started out in, in his journalistic career, you know, and he branched into other things. But it, uh, back then, it was purely football, you know. And he didn't like the way I was playing. Uh, and he, you know, he went to town on me, really. And it was difficult uh, because my mother and his father were friends. 
And my mother got up to see his father on the bus one day, and she said, will you tell that son of yours to stop having to go up my lane? <laughs> <laughs> this is how small Dublin is. <laughs> so the next time Eamon's father, well, do you want to tell it, Eamon? Well, yeah, m m my father used to sit beside Liam's mother in school. It was a mixed class, and they were really good pals. And they got, my dad used to work as a porter in the Richmond Hospital, and uh, he was going home one day for work, and Liam's mother was up, got on the bus, they sat beside each other, and he said, she said, would you, help, would you ask him to stop that? And he, he said to me, he said, look, will you stop that? Um, uh, <laughs> having a go at Liam. My mother and father didn't like the kind of things I was doing because they were modest people and they thought I was out, way out of my depth um, and was disgracing the family. <laughs> so he said... I said I that said, was only the start of that. <laughs> <laughs> he said... Uh, I said, I can't. I said, I have to do my job and um, this is my job. And I could see that you know, when I reflect on it now, I was a driven man um, at that stage in my life. Um, and I was, was way over the top. And I read something recently that Liam briefly refers to in the book uh, after Liam played at Daily Mail for on hand. And it was wrong. It was over the top. Um, and um, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Uh, people go through phases in their lives one day. You know, my passion was so, you know. But um, I apologized to Liam, uh, I think. We had, a drink. <laughs> we had a drink one night, but I thought I'd avoid being in the book, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a great man, and a, he, he was, I think, uh, trying to save a, a team. And he was taking corners and doing everything. Um, that's a moment, you know, yeah. uh, that we... Thank God we got over. Um, thanks to John's <laughs> mediation. <laughs> Kofi Annan. <laughs> well, <laughs> I come when, to that. When, when, when Jack took over, of course, Eamon fell out with Jack. <laughs> I became the best player in the world then. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Eamon, can I ask, in that period of your life where you were so out there and strong in your opinions, yes. and you're, you know, your parents are saying, come on, son, oh, yeah. would that weigh heavily on you when you're driving home that night or when you're thinking about the next day, or were you so driven that you were like, to hell with that, that's the job, no mercy? No, I mean, when you get older, I'm 78 now, you do begin to reflect on your life, and on your family, actually, and your life and the mistakes you've made and the wrongs you've done. And, you know, my mother loved me. She said, what are you doing this? In these bloody newspapers. <laughs> you know, and my father wanted me to get on because that was the only skill I had. So um, you have to understand when you're wrong. And you have to understand why you were wrong. And I was driven hmm. by a passion. Uh, a lot of what John said about the FAI and what Liam knows and said, we all went through that, and it was excruciating. You were pulling on your nation's shirt, uh, and people care. This is who I felt, the people who buy newspapers, who go to matches, who make soccer exist without the support and love and trust of the public, you're nothing. And that's what drove my journalism at a certain time. It still does today, but that's besides the point. The point is, what John is really saying in his own very understated way was a crime against Irish football and the Irish people and every kid who wanted to play football. Look at the rugby people now. Look at the joy they're giving. Look at the wonder of it. It's because it's organized. There's the best people in there. All the clowns have been thrown out. We haven't got a divorce yet. <laughs> <laughs> he does say in the book, we're pals now, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Well, a Eamon, Eamon was a bit of a hero of mine. Not as, not as big a hero as John, you know, because when I grew up, 
they were both playing uh, in England, and I remember going to Daly Mount Park of, of an evening game and watching them play for Ireland and things like that, and they were, they were big time. And then when I went to Arsenal, I had a brother live in, in New Cross, which was near the Den, where Eamon played for Millwall. And we, we, he would take me on a, on a Saturday afternoon, we'd go and watch Millwall play or an evening game, because my brother Eamon played with Eamon at Stella Maris, so he said, come, come on, we go and watch Dumphy playing, you know, so he was a hero of mine, you know. And then we were, we were friends when John got the job, but I always admired Eamon in as much, you know, when Bloody Sunday happened, he, he wanted to wear a black arm barn, you know. It, nobody would have had the courage to do that, you know. And when he was banned from the, from the Irish team for calling them out for playing Chile in Santiago when there'd been, in Santiago when there'd been uh, a terrible atrocities committed in the stadium there by the, by the right wing um, uh, junta militia. And Eamon was out there doing that, you yeah. know. So he has been a special person in, in, in Irish life, you know. Absolutely. But for, there was a few years where didn't quite like him. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, are, we are talking As about you. I, I yes, sorry. Say, uh, yes. Well, just I, I shut up now. No, no, no. After real people. No. As John said, he was all against, Allende was the guy who was the, the right wing thug and killed people, he was desperate. And I took leaflets from the guys who were, we were doing a training session in Crystal Palace with the Irish players that John had organised. And I took the leaflets from them, they were protesting and was going. And um, I passed the leaflets around to all the players. But as John tells the story, I still went. I was the first one on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, man. And, and what, what, what a lot of pe people didn't know afterwards, Eamon, Eamon was banned for life yeah. by the FAI. Because people were saying to me afterwards, why, why, why are you not picking Eamon again? I said, the, the Football Association banned him for life. Didn't that. die, yeah? So yeah. Didn't die. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so... <laughs> So that was like banned at more places as well, John. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> but we often tell a joke about Eamon when we were playing. Where, where, where was the country again, Eamon? Chile. Chile. And Eamon, when we were together, going to the, the panel, Eamon was uh, getting the lads together to tell us why we shouldn't be going to Chile. Yeah. And then there was a photograph. And who was the first on the plane? <laughs> 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 so, but Aim, 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 Aim was, was banned for life from the, for, the FEI after the... the, the for the, being critical about going to Chile. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. We could have played together midfield. How do you think we would have got on, John, me, you and Eamon? Well, after your first row, you would have been all right. <laughs> 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 no, no, Eamon, Eamon was a very good footballer. Uh, and I'm, I'm not being funny now. Eamon... I knew Eamon from, I played for Stella Maris when I was 15. Eamon is five years, I think six years younger than me. And Eamon was, lived in Stella Maris at that time. It was just down the road from where he lived. And if you were playing table tennis, suddenly the ball would disappear. Where's Eamon? <laughs> He'd nicked the ball. He was, he, he was always in trouble. He was always that way, but he was a Stella Maris, Stella Maris lad. And uh, Stella Maris was great, Eamon. I played there for a year, and it was a great, it was a great club. So, Eamon didn't have, it, didn't have it easy. He went to Manchester United when, when I was there, at a time where he was, it was very, very difficult to make the first team or the second team and that. But he made his way. He did, he did the best he, he could with what he had, mm. in my opinion. And he played at the Irish team. Many games did you play in the Irish 23. team? 23. And 23. 23. 23. So, he, he keeps blaming me. He, keeps, he, he used keeps to get a blaming me. He played 25. He, he used to get, By the way, used, this is about Liam, not me. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> he used to get 25. If you had 25 <laughs> caps, you used to get a statuette, which is very coveted, wasn't yes. it, John? And John was the manager for a couple of years, and I was two, clap, two caps short. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> He, he keeps blaming me for not getting his statuette. You, <laughs> you, used, you used to get a beautiful statuette when you, when you played 25 international matches. And Eamon got to 23. And I think I must have left you out of the squad after that, Eamon. Did I? No, you took me to, to, to South America in the trip that Liam wasn't allowed to go on and missed to play Chile, Uruguay and Brazil. And I sat on the bench for the three matches. 
sorry, you went okay. to Chile and didn't well, before, before we go any further than that, how did we get on against Brazil? Very well. Right. Two one, we were beaten. Yeah. Chile, where did you get on there? I think we won. Yeah, we won. Yeah. yeah. So we, we did it without you. you know, <laughs> Can I bring it back to Lean for a second? <laughs> so we'll round off this part of the chat by the big Jack years. So you make a, a point in the book, because it ended so badly, people can forget that actually in Euro 88, Liam, you played all eight games and you said you had a lot of good performances and you managed to adapt. That said, you do say, I did have the nagging doubt he was putting up with me, that obviously he wasn't, I wasn't quite his um, style of player. How do you reflect on those big Jack years now? Well, uh, Jack was a, a very uh, stubborn man, you know, and he, had his, he, he wanted to play football in a totally different way than I wanted to play, than John wanted to play. Uh, Jack had been indoctrinated by the Football Association in England by this fella called Charles Hughes, who wanted the ball from back to front and as quickly as possible and let the opposition deal with pressure and so forth. And Jack saw that's the way he wanted to play. So I thought I'd be in trouble, you know? And uh, I, was, I was surprised when he picked me to play against Belgium in the first matches. I didn't expect it. And, uh, and we played well, we got a 2-2 draw. Belgium were one of the foremost teams in, 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 in Europe at that time. I think they'd just got to the uh, semi-final of, uh, of the World Cup. And we got a 2-2 draw there. And I played well that day. And I kind of made myself, in, put myself in a situation where he couldn't drop me. I was playing well, I was contributing to the team. I was adapting to his way he wanted to play, you know. So we never had a problem, you know in those, in those uh, two years. And then, of course, I got sent off in that last match. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether Jack, I, there's a great picture of me coming off the field after being sent off, and he's, he's got his arm around me and saying, well done. But I, I, I don't know whether it was going through his mind. Oh, that's him out of it now. I got rid of him now. Uh, but um, we appealed that, yeah. Joe. We appealed it. And the FAI, as they, they didn't, I, I rang them up when we qualified, when Scotland beat. Yeah, this is ahead of 88, Euro 88. Yeah, I rang them up. There were, nothing was going to happen. So I got on the phone, can't remember who it was, Padder or Driscoll the second. I said, were you going to appeal? I was banned for four games, mm -hmm. which meant I couldn't play. Yeah. So he said, what do you mean appeal, Liam? You should have been sent off. I said, no, we, we've got to approach it in a different way. We've got to go and say, look, you need to be understanding that Liam Brady hasn't been sent off before, he's not a dirty player, he's, you know. And I rang Juventus, I rang Ken Fryer at Arsenal, because they had connections in UEFA, and, you know, uh, they might have an influence on the outcome of a disciplinary hearing. So, we went off to Zurich with Des Casey, who was uh, from uh, Dundalk, um, and Pat O'Brien was from uh, Cork, and he was, the, he was the president, and they were going to speak on my behalf. And we were in a big room where people had these things in their ears to translate to, to the various members of, of UEFA uh, who were from all different countries. You needed translators. So Pat O'Brien is from Cork, and my cork cousins are in tonight, so <laughs> I got to watch. And they're, and they're bigger than me. They're bigger than me. But Pat spoke very quickly. Cork people speak quickly, but Pat spoke double quick. And he was very nervous, you know? So he starts off saying, Liam Brady, the Irish football, blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking around the room, and everybody's going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't surprised because I couldn't fucking understand. <laughs> <laughs> so I grabbed a hold of Des Casey like this. Des is sitting there. I said, Des, for fuck's sake. He said, <laughs> he said, relax, relax. I got it covered. He stands up and he, he says, he looks at me and he says, gentlemen, Liam Brady is to Irish football what Michel Platini is to French football. 
and what Diego Maradona is to Brazilian football. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> they reduced my suspension by two matches. Uh, they felt so sorry for me. Uh, and I thought I, I, I could maybe get be involved in that last game of that... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it was against the Dutch, wasn't it? Against the Netherlands mm. in the last game of the group. But I got injured. I ruptured my cruciate ligament and couldn't go. But another good story, if I can tell it, Joe, is Jack asked me to go along with the team, you know. So I went along the team and also started the first bit of punditry work. I got a gig with ITV for the match. <clears throat> so we beat England, obviously. It's unbelievable that we were the first tournament we've beaten England. The, the whole country over here went, went crazy. So Jack said to me, he had me doing, you know, knock the lads up you know, get them to training, make sure they're punctual, make sure they're all on the bus. And I, I was happy to do that. But we get back to the hotel and the greatest party that ever existed happened. And Jack said, here, come here, you. That's the way he spoke to you. Come here, you. I spoke to everybody like that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, half 12, it's quarter past 12 now, get them all to bed, the team. <laughs> I said, Jack, would you ever fuck off? <laughs> he said, I don't do miracles. You tell, you tell Paul McGrath to go to bed, right? <laughs> well, actually, <clears throat> speaking of, because I'd meant to get to this earlier and I hadn't, Paul really wanted to be here. He's obviously had his, his knee replacement surgery, but he sent you a message. So now's as good a time as any to just play a little message from Paul. He said, you better play this Hi, to him. Name, play it. Uh, Paul McGrath here. I'd just like to say best of luck tonight with the book launch. Uh, sorry I can't be there, but um, I'm limping about the house here instead. But have a great night and enjoy yourself. Take care, pal. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, what, what, what a player he was. Oh, no, yeah. what a player he was. He could play, well, he could play at the back, he could play in midfield. Jack actually, the game Eamon mentioned, when Mark Lawrenson played, uh, uh, scored a goal against Scotland, Paul played right back, you know. Yeah. Jack picked a team that night, everybody was going, what? Yes. Ronnie Whelan was left back, Paul McGar was right yeah. back. You know, it was... But if, what Jack was doing was getting the best players on the pitch. Yes. Uh, and that was a marvellous victory. And, it got us on the road to, to qualify, and Jack did a brilliant job. Uh, it ended up badly with, with me being substituted after about half an hour against West Germany, which I thought was out of order. But yeah. I think he was kind of wanted to show the Irish public, in his opinion, I, was, I wasn't up to it anymore. Well, well, I, d I, didn't think, I didn't think that was right. Yeah. And that was the only time we kind of, yeah, that was, that was a lonely walk. Uh, yeah. And you retired straight away after the game. Well, I knew I was. He, I knew he didn't fancy me being around. I wasn't going to hang around. Yeah, you know. Uh, I you're, said, "Stick it up your arse." You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your brilliant um, documentary. I had just assumed. I think, like everybody, subbed in your last game after half an hour. There must be great antipathy there. And then you surprised everybody at the end of the do documentary by reading out a letter Jack had sent you a couple of months after that game. If it's okay, I might read it, because I appreciate everybody may not have seen the documentary. I think, was it, was it a couple of months or a long time after that? Oh, I thought it was a few, a few weeks, you say, in the book. No, maybe. it was a, a matter of months, John, a couple of months. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So he says, Dear Liam, I'm sorry the way things worked out after the Germany game. I wish to thank you for what you, what you did during my time with the Republic. I never intended to hurt you. Believe that. You'd be very welcome to come to Italy should we get there for Italian 90. In your testimonial, I will do all I can to help. I hope the next time we meet, you will still have a little time for me, and we might find time to repair some of the damage. It's just a quick note I felt I had to send you. All the best, Liam. I hope things work out for you, Jack. Mm. And that's when it buried the hatchet. Yeah. That was very un... I, I have to talk about Jack. I knew I played with Jack for 10 years. That was very unlike Jack, <laughs> really. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. Yeah. Jack was that type of character. In, in that Liam, he would never, ever rate Liam in his attitude and 
approach to football. I, I played with Jack for 10 years, right? And I liked Jack, I always liked him, I, I, I thought it was good, but in football terms, we were chalk and cheese. This is at the Leeds team, and this is how I'll explain Jack in many ways. Jack was a big centre half, and Jack was uh, a very, very self-conscious guy. He, he believed in himself, and everybody else was wrong. And Jack was a centre half who saw the game through the eyes of a big centre half, right? And in the Leeds situation, we could win ten matches on the trot, and then lose a match, and there'd be a crisis meeting. And the first thing from, Jack, from anybody would be Jack in the crisis meeting. Those two little bastards are coming back too far. <laughs> that was me and Bremner, <laughs> right? They're receiving the ball on the edge of the back, or the edge of the box, because. I'll just tell you now, Jack saw the world through his own eyes. And I was very friend, friendly, I like Jack, but in football terms, in the world, he saw the world through his own eyes. So if Bremner and I received the ball on the edge of the box, we were two small guys, uh, good on the ball, wouldn't lose it, or very seldom lost it. Jack saw himself on the edge of the box with the ball at his feet. And he would lose it. Because <laughs> he was a big centre-half, and one of the best centre-halves he ever played with. But he could not believe anybody in a creative sense, ever. Because I, I, I played with him for 10 years, and that's what, he, that's what he was like. In his own eyes, you get the ball, you don't, me and Bremner, you're going to lose it. Because we could say, when did we lose this, Jack? We didn't. We didn't. Well, we might have lost it now and again, but very, very seldom. Because that's what we had. We had, that, we had that ability. Jack didn't have that ability. So he could only see the world through his own eyes. That's why he didn't like Liam. He didn't like anybody. If you look at, at Jack's record, uh, who was the lad for Liverpool? Whelan? Run, Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie Whelan, yourself. All that. He got them out of it, right? But what Jack did believe was in himself. So that's how he became successful with the Irish team. He believed in what he was doing. I read a book recently where Jack said in the book, he told the goalkeeper, under no circumstances whatsoever, do you throw the ball out to the right back or the left back? Now that's an amazing statement to say. Because say the goalkeeper does in certain matches pick it up and the right back is on his own, the left back is on his own. You're not to give it to him. Get it out there. Get it up there. Right? And we had terrific players with the Irish team. Terrific players. As I said, Liam was punished through it. But that was Jack. But he believed in himself in a big way. I'll give him credit for that. In other words, this is what I believe in. This is what we're going to do. There's no messing about. Because you get certain players who doubt the manager, start giving out to him. Or, that, that didn't happen with yes, Jack. Yeah. And, and, but, but Jack had a terrific group of players at his disposal, in my opinion, yeah. at, that, at that time. Because uh, when Jack went to Middlesbrough, as a manager, remember the, my time, there was two players at the time, so I res resigned. Ian St. John from Liverpool and Jack from Leeds. I would have put my life and, at that time on Ian St. John doing the job. I wouldn't have given Jack tuppence to do the job. And he did it, and he did it in the way that he wanted to do it, mm. and did it really well. Mm. He was an all right guy. He was an all right guy. I, re I really mean that, yeah. yeah. Jack you could have a game of cards with him. Remember, I told yeah. you, John. Yeah, yeah, but and, if, he, and if he was losing, he'd throw the pack of cards, throw out, the cards the out the window. <laughs> he, he, used, he, he well he learned to do that with leads over the years. In, in the, that was this was the kind of man you were dealing with. Yeah. Okay, no? so. you were dealing with him. That was Jack. Yeah, and I like Jack because you knew where you were with him. Yeah. He wasn't trying to do anything behind your back. Yeah. And anyway, and I was ten years when I was stripped myself, and and that's the way he was. And I got on, I got on really well with him. Yeah. He, was, he was a character of his own, you know, he, he had to see the world through his own eyes and, and do it, you know. And he was a good Yorkshire, he wasn't a Yorkshire machine, he was a good man. <laughs> he was a good, Jack had a great way on the, on the way out with some new lads coming out for the night out, right? His big, big, big trick was, <laughs> I've, I've left my money at home, can you give me a fiver? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we all went through it. <laughs> and none of, none of us got the fiver back. <laughs> so all I'm saying about Jack, I... Like chalk and cheese football, no doubt. As an individual, I liked him. Okay. But I remember uh, just one more tale yes. about Jack. 
and it was, I was going back on the, uh, Dublin on the plane with him to, uh, to Birmingham. He was going somewhere. And he said... Uh, when, when was this, John? Hmm? When was this? This was quite near his time, or near his end of his time at, in the Irish management. Okay. Right. Because I said I was very pally with Jack. But anyway, we're on the plane. And he said, I've got to go to such and such a place tomorrow. And this taxi driver, he says, tells me that there's uh, roadworks and I have to go the long way round. He said, I told him, I'm not fucking paying you any more than... <laughs> he, he, says, he says, John, you know what I'm like? A pound is still a pound to me. Right. Uh, but the, but he wouldn't try and do you. Mm. You know what I mean? He, mm. wasn't, he wasn't sly. And I, whatever he was doing, he would tell you out, out straight. Okay. And that was his big thing with the Irish team. I didn't agree with what we did with Liam and certain players in, on the team. But that's what he believed in. Yes. Before the clock comes against us, Niall Cogley, who's the head of sport at RTE, calls you ahead of France 98 and says, Liam, I'd like you to come to the panel with Eamon and John. And you said? I said I couldn't work with Dumphy. <laughs> and that's not a joke. No, it was deadly serious. No. What did you Eamon, say? Eamon had crucified me down through the years, you know, so I didn't fancy working with him, you know, so. Uh, he made me an offer then, uh, a very good financial offer, didn't I? And I thought, well, maybe I could work with him. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, I you said, you said you sound like Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I rang John, I phoned a friend, and I said, John, what do you think? He said, well, you know, yeah, take, come on, come on, come on board. Uh, if you don't like it, you can always, you know, obviously, if you don't get on, we don't get on, you can always leave. So, mm. um, I came on board, and John said to me, you'll never, ever, ever be bored in Eamon's company. <laughs> <laughs> and he was absolutely right about that, and we ended up going out together, ha you know, having drinks together, going for meals together, and we've been friends ever since. Yes. Except when... Except when... Uh, oh, I'll come to that. Or you're going to come to that. <laughs> <laughs> how good were these three on uh, television, by the way? Oh, how, yeah. how, how good were they? I mean, they were just so amazing. <laughs> and I think... Uh, I mean, you guys must have known how much everybody loved you, and it was more entertaining than the football, and it was what we talked about the next day. I, I, I can't over-exaggerate just how wonderful it was. We tried to pick out a couple of your best bits. So I don't know if we can play them all if we have time. Uh, let's start, Mick, if we could, with uh, Ronaldo at a certain point in his career. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was frustrating the panel at a certain point in his younger days. So uh, roll it there. Ronaldo's performance tonight was a disgrace to football. Liam doesn't want me to say this. He said, get myself into trouble. It was a disgrace. In what the, sense was it? It was a disgrace. disgrace of petulance, temperament, throwing himself on the ground at least half a dozen times looking for fouls that he didn't get, claiming two penalties which he didn't get, but waving his arms at other players on his own team. Mm. It was a disgrace to professional We've football. We've seen it before, though. Now, yeah. you asked before, was this a, about two great young players, Messi and Ronaldo? Well, if it was, Messi proved himself after only 45 minutes football in the last six weeks, to be at least a real pro and a real player. This fellow Ronaldo is a cod. I don't care yeah, if he scores. I mean, you can't if he scores, say that, I'm telling you, scores this was got. a big match. <laughs> if he scores a thousand goals in the Premier League season, to go out and behave himself in a big match, in a semi-final, the way he behaved himself tonight, right up to the final seconds of the match, he was diving, pretending he was pushed, throwing his hands up in the air, we've cut away shots of him there, He's a disgrace. He's a disgrace to the game. Ah, that's putting it too strongly that's all my, together. Hold on a minute. That's what I believe. Am I here to express my beliefs? Yes, you Am are. But well, it's a very strong viewpoint, isn't it? Well, I don't think John's a million miles away from me. No, I would have to say, Bill, I found his performance against Arsenal last week in the, in the Arsenal match was, was disgraceful. He wasn't far off that tonight. And I'm like Eamon. I, I'd love to be praising uh, Ronaldo. But I'm, I'm not going to praise him. I'm going to stick to what I, I believe in, what great players should be doing. And I don't mind him missing the penalty tonight, because anybody can miss a penalty. That's all part, that's part of the game. I wouldn't even criticise him for that. But the, the reaction in certain situations that I've seen with Ronaldo, again, waving his arms, and his own players as well. I've seen him do that before. That's a taster. I've got another one. 
you can, you can come in after the other one. I have two more quick ones. The office voted for their favourite ones. That's how we uh, mm -hmm. arrived at these three. Uh, there was a time when things weren't going well for Wenger. And, I mean, you boys could have a Barney. So let's have a look here. Look away. The John Cleese look. <laughs> uh, he'll be very, very disappointed. Uh, but I think that's very understandable, of course. I'd be very disappointed no, if I was in this position. No, but the thing is, he will... When he, like well, you've shown that if they had a won tonight. Well, that's a good no, point. On a no, I well, think that's on. terrible. Do that's you? diabolical. Well, okay, I think okay, it's okay, diabolical. Give me, give I think it's me, diabolical. I think the man has to be applauded. His team were magnificent yeah. tonight. Made mistakes, but if we lose this guy to English football, if this guy's yeah. lost to English football, it's a Would big, be big but, but yeah, I mean, Hold on a minute now. No, hold on a minute. That's, that's, that's hold poor. on a minute. That's hold poor. on a minute. That's poor. I agree. That's a setup. I agree. To Wenger losing the game tonight, that is. Yeah, it's, called an, it's called analysis. Lee. No, that's not it's, analysis. It that is analysis. A, that was already in the can yeah, waiting to go out. Yeah, good. Because we are... No, based, we're looking, no. no that was based on, on the body language be, that be, has been no, spoken about. No, based on the man losing a game tonight. No, that's what based on the fact that he seems to be more agitated, yeah. and there's an argument. No, the man is to be applauded. And not. Rafa Benitez is to be applauded, and the game's to be applauded. Uh, hold on a minute now. You've jumped over the fence, baby. We're entitled to do our analysis. No. Oh, whatever yeah, way yeah. we want. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one, <laughs> the very last one, I apologize to you. I think you're going to not like this, no but, 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 um, no it came in, voted at number one. And, and to be fair, the man in question took it all in good spirits as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is unpre unprecedented yeah. and it's so unacceptable. So it's his achievement and it's not unprecedented. Well, he, his achievement didn't go hand in hand with this kind of behaviour. Just a moment. Roy Keane... He didn't go hand in hand. 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 You know, he was black winning black all those black trophies black. as a tug. No, but when he was oh, winning I'm, all those... I'm not going to listen to that kind of... If you're going to start quoting... Bill, but, uh, Bill can, can I, can I, I say something? There's an alternative to you. Can, can I say something? No, I'm saying to you, there's an alternative to you. If you're going to... You must recognise. If you are going to quote gutter journalists calling Roy Keane a tug, you can do it on your own. If you're going to throw my Mother Teresa, you can do that on your own as well. Amen. There's lots of tabloid journalists out there. I'm not going to listen to that kind Fair of... Enough. Right, listen, I, I am saying that written down in black and white in the Sunday Times was that particular... Well, I just say no, to you... You may not agree with that point. I just say to you, I tell you, written down almost everywhere, and certainly in the annals of football, will be tributes to this man. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with this that. This is a I man argument with that. who doesn't showboat like Niall Quinn. This is a man who actually goes and sees sick children in hospital. This is a family man with five mm. children who's a credit to his country and to his family. For and I'm not going to listen to him being called a tug by you. I don't, don't want to hear what... I think, hang on a second, no, don't misquote me. I said that was written. Why are you not interested in this, this Because I'm what? saying there's an alternative yes. view. And whose view is it? Yeah. That's the, that's the yeah. view that we're doing. Whose view is it? In a column on the Sunday Times. Who's that column? I'm saying By who? It's on the back page of the Sunday Times last Sunday. Look at it. And who wrote it? I can't remember his name. I'll tell you who wrote it. Oh. I can remember his name. Rod Little. He's yeah, the guy who guy. ran away and left his wife for a young one. I am a command, though. That's all it was. Okay. I didn't. I don't even know who I can't get that. I know. <laughs> what did he say there? <laughs> He said he ran off for his, <laughs> left his wife for a young <laughs> Oh dear. By the way, by the way, I actually apologised to Joe Duffy. Joe Duffy yeah. rang me the next day and in his own inimitable way, he caught me in the trap. He said, Eamon, I saw that last. It was great. He said, um, would you come on the show? And, <laughs> and I was dying to apologize to the man. And he said, and Joe rings up at quarter past two. Hello, Eamon, how are you? Uh, it's great of you to join us. He said, we have Rod Diddle on the other line. <laughs> 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 Which is like the snake. And I said, to, I said to Rod, I'm really sorry. This is, nobody could excuse what I did. I lost it. And anyway, quite recently, as a matter of interest, um, he wrote about it again, and he said, by the way, I'm still with the young one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure John and Liam will tell you, Liam, maybe it's Liam's show. Like, Bill had a way, didn't he, Liam? He what? 
Bill had a way. Oh, he had a way. Ball. Well, he hopped the ball. I mean, yeah, it was a great, 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 great. Yeah. Um, they were great times, weren't they? They were yeah. great times. Oh. Yeah. 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 And, and we have Joe now, who is the great anchor in sport on Virgin, Stop, and has man. proved it during the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> Bill was. Yeah. Bill was, yeah. <laughs> Bill was Cork, uh, and he loved John. You know, after the, uh, <laughs> take, you know that Wenger, he, he said Bill loved you more than me and more than him. <laughs> he did, Dave. <laughs> he did. Oh, John was the favourite. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. No. Uh, a a said, I, I didn't feel that. <laughs> Eamon set the agenda. He did really set yeah. the agenda, and he was brilliant, you know, uh, picking things out or building a match up, yeah. what we should talk about. And we were in control there, and Bill just had that great way of keeping the thing going. And you know, yeah. Bill if it great. needed livening up, he would throw a grenade in. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Bill was Bill. Bill was great. What he did, great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. And uh, what was it like? Because Eamon was a force of nature. You know, he just was. You can see it there. What was it like sitting next to him when he was full on? Eamon. Yeah. <laughs> well, Eamon. Eamon contributed to the program. And, and was it was, no, seriously, and it was a major oh, contributor. Yeah. I mean, the, the program or the, the panel wouldn't have been the same without Eamon. There's no doubt about and that. But did you ever find it a touch um, difficult when he was coming at you, boom, 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 loud? Of course. Who wouldn't? Because <laughs> 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 Eamon's coming at you, he's coming at you. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, uh, luckily enough, like in Liam's, Liam's case, in my case, well, you know, we, we were confident enough that we could, speak for ourselves yeah. you know like uh, uh, that's the way it was I mean that's what what the panel was I mean if, if it was it couldn't be, be a panel without Eamon mm. couldn't be the panel without Eamon in his uh, Liam in his contribution and mine and my it, that, that's what made the panel yeah I mean if, if we were three of us the same be a bore yeah you know so Eamon made sure it wasn't a bore <laughs> <laughs> Bill was a great journalist yes and he had a journalist instinct Every match has a story. Every match. A League of Ireland match or a kids match. There's a story in every match. And Bill understood that, and I understand that. And I was agitated. I said I'd leave RT if they didn't get John. And Tim O'Connor, the late Tim O'Connor, who was brilliant and made my life different, um, said, but he won't say anything. I said, he will, because John wasn't good with the press at all. He, uh, he, w he, didn't, he disdained the press and all of that stuff. And um, uh, I said, Tim, me and Bill, I'm, I'm burning myself out and making a fool of myself. We need the gravitas, the intelligence, and the wisdom, and the, the manner of John Giles on our screen, or we're finished. And I said that to, to Bill, and I said it to Tim, if you don't get John, I'm out of here. And I took it right to the very edge, and they got John. And we all know now, you know, he's an iconic figure because of his wisdom, his temperament, uh, his generosity, and he was the making of it. It wasn't me going mad. People get fed up with that stuff. And at a certain point, I felt we needed Liam. And I went in and I fought. And I fought Tim again, uh, although Fred, uh, now Cogley was the one, Tim was the pulling all the strings. Right. And I also fought for the money. And I told you, I'm, Tim, I was getting, I told John, I told Liam, and we were working hard. But it was, it was a team, a group of people running the show from the floor where there was both the journalists knowledge and the football knowledge, which they both had. And that was perfect. Mm. Now, the guys who came in as producers and editors, they were used to running the show. And that's what English stuff is, and most of it's rubbish. And that's, it is rubbish, because the people who know what the agenda should be before at halftime and afterwards are only there to serve whatever is upstairs. And my attitude to that was, 
if we do it this way, it'll work. And it did work. And a, I, I have an awful lot of faults. An awful lot of faults. But I was right about that. And they're the two guys who made it, and the late Bill. Yes. Well said, uh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I'd like to say here, there's no doubt that the panel wouldn't have been what it was if it hadn't been for Eamon. Eamon was, was doing his stuff before I came in, and then later, later came. Because what happened was st uh, our pal, Tim. Yeah. I was very popular. Tim McConnell, yeah. Right. And Eamon said, we should get John on the panel. And Tim said, no, oh, John doesn't say anything. <laughs> now, when I was manager, I didn't say anything. Because it wasn't up to because what you get with the press, you say with your manager, uh, you, you, you missed it in midfield today when you lost. Yeah. Well, I thought, well, if I say yes, Liam could say to me, fuck you, John. Yeah. And Mick Martin could say to me, fuck you, John. So I say, no, I don't think so. So I had a reputation of giving nothing, nothing, which mm. is true, mm. to the press with my players, right? Because I had a thing when I was a manager with, with the players, Whatever we say here, we it keep it here. We do it here. Whatever we after that, we don't do it. So I had to be true to that. Like if the if the, if the newspaper press said you lost it in midfield, and I said yeah we did, Liam could and Rick Martin. What yes, the fuck's yeah, going on? You You're telling us not to say anything. And now you that that type of thing. So I I had a reputation of saying nothing, which was true. So when Eamon approached Tim O'Connor to get me. Tim says, no, I mean, sure, John doesn't say anything. There's no point in having him. But Eamon persisted. Yes. Because I did say to Eamon, Eamon, Tim can fuck off. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not into that. But that's, that was the, the build-up to it. Yeah, yeah. And then, then Liam coming on to it. Because, you see, what happened in the old days, the, the, there was a saying, and Eamon was, was famous for it. This is run, run from the floor. Because what used to happen in the past with RTE and other situations, you had somebody, you come in, say it was Eamon, myself and Liam in the old days, before we got it right. Yes. The guy that was in charge, right, this is what we're talking about tonight. This is what we're going to do. This is not what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Mm. So what happened before I came on the show, Eamon told them to fuck off. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. And it's from the floor. Not like Eamon. This is <laughs> so no. so Eamon, Eamon got me on. You know, because Tim O'Connor was a Palomoy and Anne Diamonds, and he said, no, we're not having John. But Eamon persisted on yeah. that. So we, it, all I'm saying is we wouldn't have had the panel that we had yes. when Eamon did himself if, if Eamon hadn't have done what he did. I, I just want to say about John and Liam, they're two of the greatest minds on football. Not just being great players, but being great uh, analysts. What's going on? Why is this match not working out? Who's doing what? They buy that and to let it breathe and give it time. Mm. It's precious to everybody who was watching. I mean, the game is for the people. It isn't for people on television or for Ronaldo. It's actually to help people understand and enjoy, you know, the way you've done on Virgin with brilliant yourself and three brilliant analysts, Shane Organ, you know, Rob Carney, uh, and Matt Williams. And this is adds to the enjoyment. We're not important. Yes. But Liam came on, and his brilliant brain, and his rigor, and his capacity. Three north side guys who could express themselves without the gym. Go on, Eamon. North side. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's right. <laughs> it's right. They, in England, you get fellas who are great players, they can't put two words together. And, and I hated that, because it wasn't representative of us. Yeah. And I wanted it to be representative. Yes. And here was three kids who never got second level education. Go, baby! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm sad to say our time is coming to a close. Um, this has been very special. It's been great to have you here. I think everybody would agree to, to have the guys here. It's just amazing.
But can I just say something here? Of course you can. Uh, I think it's great to see the audience here. Uh, and this is obviously for Liam. Liam was one of our great players. He was, we were on the panel for years and we got on well. And, uh, but this is for Liam. Yes. Liam was great. Great player, a great panelist, and a great individual. Now, if you... <laughs> Whatever about Dunphy, if you start getting emotional, we're all going to be toast here now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liam, the night has been about you, and rightly so. Um, maybe a word on these two gents, either side of you, and, and um, what they've meant to you. And well, a big part of, part of my life, big, big part of my life for since 1998. You know, well, Eamon was a terrible part of my life. Early, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, from 1998, big part of my life. Great fun together, great crack together. Uh, just, just hit it off, all three of us. Um, yeah, not a, not a good panel. Great panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was uh, it was so lovely to do this with you guys. Uh, the very best of luck with the book. There it is. There, you all have signed copies, I think. So a big thank you to Eamon Dunphy to John Giles and for the night that's in it. To Mr. Liam Brady, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah.